So when I think about people in the Bible who I can identify with, Jonah is my personality twin in a lot of ways. Mainly just to be clear, it's because of his cowardice. The cowardice is where we are similar. I spent so many years of my life running away from God, running away from the things he calls all Christians to do because I was afraid of people. <laughs> mean people, murderous people, people who want me to volunteer in kids ministry, you know? So this week we looked at Jonah. God wanted Jonah to go into a really scary neighborhood and preach the good news to people who were evil and who had a reputation for being cruel to their enemies. If you did the personal study this week, maybe you remember what I found super interesting, that Nineveh is actually modern day Iraq, still a place where Christ followers are persecuted today. It's crazy. So we read about Jonah disobeying and running from God and then getting caught in a storm and thrown overboard. And then, so, so cool, we read about his prayer from the belly of the fish, which remember was actually him referencing whatever prayer he prayed when he thought he was drowning in the water. So God saves his life in such a creative way with a giant fish and Jonah, foreshadowing the three days of death and resurrection of Jesus, spends three days in that fish before he spit out onto dry land, his second chance. And then he obeys. And a lot of Sunday school teachers probably end the story there, even though the story doesn't end there in the Bible. When we read to the end, we see Jonah used powerfully by God to witness to the evil Ninevites. We read about their hearts turning to the Lord. What a miracle, what a mercy. And then we read about Jonah being angry enough to die. So he's suicidal, miserable, full of anger, upset that God had mercy on the people. So that was a quick walkthrough. But throughout this story, we see an anxious and cowardly Jonah turn into an angry and bitter Jonah. But the whole time, his eyes are on the wrong prize. The root of the problem in the story is clear. Jonah had the wrong king. Jonah was Jonah's king. When Jonah thought he was in danger, he got scared and ran away because Jonah thought Jonah was the most important. And so Jonah wanted Jonah to do everything he could do to protect Jonah. <laughs> so here's a personal testimony of my Jonah tendencies. I have three daughters and our middle one we adopted from China in 2017. She was born without any ears, so no ears, deaf, mute, severely malnourished, couldn't walk, and she wasn't potty trained and a whole bunch more challenges we didn't learn about until we met her. So on paper, it looked impossible, like a hopeless situation to take on. And you know, it's just like God that he'd use the most unlikely of humans to care for this girl. God knew, people in my life knew that I live so often in fear. So prior to adoption season, my husband and I would have knockdown drag outs, not literally, but for sure some yelling involved. <laughs> um, and they were about adoption because he wanted to and I was terrified of it. I was scared of every single thing involved. I was scared of the piece of paper that I knew they gave you where you have to choose the gender and the race and the special needs. And I thought I can choose someone just like me, a healthy newborn, but then I'll feel guilty every moment of every day for the rest of my life for not choosing the most sick and the most needy and the most different from me orphan. Or I can find the most needy, different, sick child, and that'll be the hardest thing ever. And what if I adopt someone violent? Or what if they scream all day? And what if, what are the, okay. So <laughs> my fears ruled over me. I'm sure you've had seasons like this. My decisions were all filtered by questions. Is this safe for me? Is this safe for my kids? I had a shielded posture and I pretty much prayed things like, protect me and my family, please keep us safe. And I planned my life around safety and I was a miserable person. <laughs> Just like Jonah, Scarlet was my king and I wanted to do anything to protect Scarlet and what Scarlet loved. It's such a long story, but God used his people, broken, flawed people like me who were adopting orphans and continuing to live and smile and cry and exist even through the hard stuff, to nudge my heart toward obedience. On the day God dropped the desire to adopt on me, I was driving to the grocery store with my oldest and youngest. They were five and one because I'd forgotten dishwasher detergent. And my oldest, because she'd just seen pictures from one of my friends who'd adopted, she said from the back of the car, I'm so glad I have a home to live in and a mommy and daddy, and I'm so glad I'm not stuck in one of those wooden cribs. And I did what we Christian parents who want to raise kids to fear the Lord often do, which is like recite the Christian-y things that fit the situation. <laughs> So I was like, ever, yes, it's a wonderful thing when a mommy and a daddy have what they need to be able to adopt an orphan and the way God adopted us into his family through Jesus, you know. And then <laughs> the only way I can explain it is that it felt like God snapped his fingers and my heart exploded. And I was suddenly sobbing uncontrollably, like, thank God he adopted me. My fears disappeared in that moment and I had this strong desire to adopt a little girl from China with special needs. So I called my husband and he cried too, and we began the adoption process the next day. And God continued to lead me toward obedience and continued to care for me through my fears. I felt protected and peaceful as God met our every need. I mean, he gave us funding to adopt through our church body. He led us directly to our little joy. And then we met her and her needs were so intense, we didn't think she'd survive. And if she did, 
We just assumed we'd be pushing her in a wheelchair and changing her diapers for the rest of her life. She seemed so far gone that when we met her, we grieved the reality we imagined, that she'd never learned a sign, that we'd never get to sign to her about Jesus, that she would just be a body that God wanted us to feed and care for for the rest of our lives. And we knew God told us to adopt her, but it just felt so heavy. <laughs> our memory verse this week was, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, Matthew 6, 33 and 34. Let's pause on that for just a moment and help our hearts not be like Jonah and not be like Scarlet who refused to adopt. So one, that verse reminds us that there is a kingdom of God. What an incomparable comfort to know that there's a bigger kingdom than what we can see, led by a better king than we can be. We are bad kings in a broken kingdom, but there is a kingdom of God. Two, this verse reminds us there is a righteousness we didn't earn. When we are our kings, when we lead ourselves, we only find unrighteousness that leads to brokenness. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus lived fully righteous in our place, died in our place, was raised in our place, giving us access to the righteousness and all the benefits that come with that righteousness for free. <laughs> and three, then this verse tells us that when we seek the kingdom led by God and the righteousness of Jesus, our savior, all these things will be provided for you, for you. <laughs> All these things will be provided for you by a better king than you could ever be. Then Jesus told us not to worry about tomorrow. He told us there's a better king. Let me finish with this. In those early days, having Joy home, we just took it a day at a time. Doctor's appointments and screaming tantrums and being held together by our church friends who fed us and loved us and prayed over us. We couldn't do any more than that. We could barely see to the next hour, much less the next day. But when Jesus is king of your life, he really does carry your burdens. So don't worry about tomorrow. He really does provide for you. He really does lead you to peace that passes understanding. Later in the book of Matthew, Jesus said this. This is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, living a life that says, God, I will obey, I will go to China, or I will go to Nineveh, or I will parent, or I will work, or I'll serve sacrificially, that's hard. <laughs> but when Jesus is your king, it doesn't have to feel like it. Jesus is the king that we need. His yoke is easy, his burden is light, his provision is everything. His reign is forever. King Jesus has the answers for your worries, he really does. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for putting the book of Jonah in the Bible. Thank you for what we can learn from him. And thank you for being our king. Help us to live like it and trust you. In your name, amen.